Hello, everyone. I'm Olympia. Thank you for being here with me in this wonderful place called Lights Out Library. And I have a great story to tell you. We are going to take a walk in a forest and discover a lot of things about trees, how they live and how they grow, and their evolutionary history along with their complexity. They are not just living machines growing by absorbing nutrients, water, and carbon. They also interact with their environment. They heal. They harbor entire worlds, not just over our heads, but under our feet too. We will also discover remarkable plants from around the world. Some that are the tallest organisms in our planet, and others that are older than the pyramids of Egypt. I hope this moment in nature will relax you and help you fall asleep. As always, I encourage you to close your eyes at any time during our exploration and let my voice and your imagination be your guide. If you fall asleep and wish to resume the video later or jump directly to a particular part of the story, timestamps are listed in the first comment under the video. But for now, all you need to do is get comfortable. There's probably too much tension in your shoulders right now. You need to become aware of it and now gently release it. Take a deep breath and allow your shoulders to drop. And now, breathe normally. Relax your arms, your hands, your legs, all the way down to your feet. Let's begin our journey. Trees are such a familiar thing. Whether you live in a city or small town, that we start to take them for granted hardly paying any attention to them most of the time. It is estimated that there are three trillion trees in the world. That is to say, 400 trees per human being. Some are small, some over 300 feet high, but all are part of a family of organisms woody plants with which humans share a surprising 50% of our DNA. Our fates are inextricable since humanity throughout its history has depended on forests as a major source of food, building materials, and wood for fuel in most communities. Trees could be seen as magical or sacred, and trees were worshipped in many ancient civilizations, mostly because trees have their roots in the ground and their branches extending towards the sky. This biological imperative has come to represent some sort of connection between the mysterious and the literal, the earth and the heavens. For example, in North mythology, Yggdrasil, the world tree, was home to nine worlds, ours among them. And these nine worlds were stacked up, one above the other, around the tree, or grouped around it with the rainbow bridge that connects this tree 
with these different worlds. This concept of the world tree exists in ancient Indo-European religions, in Siberia, and in Native American religions too. Another motive that appears in a lot of popular stories and beliefs around the world is the idea that there can be an intimate connection between a tree and a human being. Sometimes a man's life depends upon the tree and suffers when it withers, as if there was some sort of sympathy between the two. Or a newborn child is associated with a newly planted tree with which its life is supposed to be bounded. There are people in West Africa, in the Congo, the Yubanji, that keep this tradition alive. But in the past, it was a more widespread belief. Trees were also worshipped or attributed powers to fulfill wishes. For example, the Celts venerated trees and their druids, their priests, performed rituals in the woods. To ancient Greeks, there were shy creatures or spirits called dryads who were believed to live in trees. There are more examples of this and these beliefs keep existing with wish trees in which people hang ribbons or they offer coins or other offerings in hopes that their wish may come true. The concept of a tree of life of a tree with the power to grant wishes, knowledge, even immortality, exists or has existed in multiple cultures around the world. But what is a tree exactly? We all understand what a tree looks like, but the term tree is everyday language and doesn't define a particular type of plant, but rather a shape. Plenty of plants which are not directly related have developed characteristics that makes us call them trees. First, they are perennials, meaning they live for a relatively long time, for several years usually. Second, they have a trunk, an elongated stem that grows upwards and supports branches and leaves. But all trunks are not created equal. For example, palm trees have very little in common with an oak or a birch. Palms grow a trunk because their leaves grow on top of each other, so that year after year a palm becomes taller, but a palm's trunk will never grow wider or form tree rings. There are other plants that are sometimes called trees, such as tree ferns, bananas, or bamboo, but like palms, they do not have the woody trunk on which the secondary growth of branches occurs or the widening of the trunk year after year. Trees might seem like fairly basic organisms to most of us. They gather water and minerals from the soil, carbon from the air, and grow using these building materials. And yes, this is all true, but there is in fact so much more to trees. We're going to look 
below the surface, both of the soil and of a tree's bark, to discover the surprises hidden there. Did you know, for example, that trees have an internal biological clock? That they have sensors? They also somehow exchange information with each other. They modify the composition of the air around them. They have a mysterious mechanism that humans still don't fully understand that makes them grow straight, independent from light, the magnetic field of Earth or gravity. They can sometimes form colonies and help other trees around them. More generally, we are going to explore forests, their complex ecosystems, and their plant and animal life. We will also travel from Asia to America and discover record-breaking trees renowned for their size, age, and unique characteristics. But let's begin by talking about plants in general. Where do plants come from? Like animal life, it is believed that plants came from Earth's seas and were some of the most ancient life forms to appear on the planet. The first plants, as far as we know, were algae, forming mats in the ocean. These mats still exist and are composed of blue-green bacteria that use photosynthesis, that is, the conversion of light energy into chemical energy. In the process, they break down carbon dioxide molecules, releasing oxygen and keeping the carbon for themselves. This mechanism is the basis of most plant life on Earth. There are ancient fossil rock formations called stromatolites, which are the remains of these first marine organisms. They date back 1.2 billion years ago, long before any terrestrial life existed. These first plants, algae, played a huge role in the transformation of Earth because they oxygenated the atmosphere over hundreds of millions of years. They changed the climate and the composition of the air, as well as the waters in the oceans. This paved the way for other forms of life to appear in the seas. It is unclear how the first land plants began. For a long time, it was believed that marine plants diversified and grew in size until they started to adapt to land life and colonize the continents. But over the past decades, another theory has emerged, that microscopic algae colonized the land, living underground, maybe long before the appearance of land plants. And it was this algae that evolved into larger terrestrial plants. In any case, we have evidence of the first land plants around 450 million years ago in a period called the Ordovician, when animal life was still absent on land or limited to very small organisms living in wet underground environments. Tens of millions of years passed before these primitive land plants diversified into a variety of new species, 
and began to adopt the features that we associate with land plants, roots, leaves, a trunk that is able to grow over time, and secondary wood, that is to say, branches that grow from the trunk or stem. 400 million years ago, in a period now called the Devonian, most of these features had appeared. And a bit later, a bit later meaning a few million years later, the first seeds appeared. At this point, about 360 million years ago, large, upright plants forming wood tissue were now present and colonizing the earth. The first forests were born, and over millions of years they covered the land where conditions allowed. They needed enough water and warm enough temperatures. The continents turned green and gave birth to new ecosystems where terrestrial life flourished. At the time, some of the most successful plant forms were mosses and ferns, both of which are still familiar to us and present in most of our forests. Moss is a relatively simple plant form and tends to form clumps or mats and grows directly on the ground or trunks. Moss has a single stem with tiny leaves directly attached to it, but there is close to no circulation of water and nutrients inside the plant. Moss is sometimes confused with lichen, which also thrives on trunks or rocks, but is a completely different kind of organism. A lichen is a composite that arises from mutualistic relationships between fungi and algae or bacteria. This is a symbiotic relationship in which the algae and bacteria provide fuel to the fungi through photosynthesis. Photosynthesis creates carbohydrates, sugars, on which the fungi feed, and the algae benefits from the moisture and nutrients from the environment that the fungi gathers and the protection it provides. This symbiotic relationship appeared quickly as life spread on the continents. And because lichens are not a single organism, but rather a colony, they can have extremely long lifespans. There are lichens on Earth today that are several thousands of years old. As far as we know, they hold the record for longevity among terrestrial life forms. Lichens have colonized every continent, including Antarctica, and come in a huge variety of shapes and colors. But they are not plants, or not entirely. I told you that mosses were already thriving 350 million years ago, and so were ferns. Ferns are a more elaborate kind of plant because they are vascular, meaning they have tissue that allows them to conduct water and minerals throughout the plant. Ferns also use this vascular system to circulate the byproduct of photosynthesis, carbohydrates mainly, throughout its structure. 
vascularization is a major evolutionary step toward the appearance of trees and generally bigger plants that can rise above the surface. Ferns have been around for hundreds of millions of years already and have diversified into thousands of species. Most of the species alive today appeared 100 to 200 million years ago. There is even one fern that grows in the eastern United States and Canada, the interrupted fern, which is remarkable for having remained unchanged for more than 180 million years. According to fossil records, that's when it stopped evolving. Ferns use spores to reproduce, not seeds or flowers. And here's how it works. If you look on the underside of a fern's leaf, you will see small round spots laid out in rows that look almost like an insect laid its eggs there. But these are actually little stacks of powder, of spores. And these spores are used for the fern's reproduction. The spores are very light and they can be easily carried away by the wind or an animal brushing against them. Each spore is a tiny unit of reproduction. Most of the time they consist of a single cell and when this cell finds favorable conditions, water, the right temperature, something to hang on to, it begins dividing. This is a process called mitosis. When the cell replicates itself, it has chromosomes in its nucleus, and the nucleus splits into two cells with identical chromosomes, carrying the code for the organisms to live and grow. The multiplication continues, giving birth to a new plant. This process is asexual reproduction wherein a plant provides all the material needed to reproduce itself. Other spores use sexual reproduction, meaning cells have only half the chromosomes, and a different spore has to provide the other half of the genetic code. Sexual reproduction that combines two reproductive cells is the most common life cycle in multicellular organisms used by plants, fungi, and animals too, including humans. This might seem paradoxical considering that sexual reproduction is more complicated. Asexual reproduction should theoretically be the preferred form of reproduction. Every organism alone could bear its own young. And an asexual population has the intrinsic capacity to grow more rapidly with each generation. But sexual reproduction has its advantages too. It favors diversity of genes. It impedes the accumulation of genetic mutations that can make species disappear. And it is also a powerful evolutionary force because within a population of the same species, some individuals will be able to out-reproduce others because they are better at spreading their genes, better at securing mates when it comes to animals or spreading their reproductive cells when it comes to plants. 
This selection process boosts natural selection from one generation to the next. It is almost imperceptible, but over time, over tens or hundreds of generations, species can better adapt to their environments. They can avoid the risk of extinction and instead thrive. We think this is why sexual reproduction dominates when it comes to more complex organisms. But in nature, as with our ferns, sexual and asexual reproduction coexist. The first kinds of trees to appear were probably tree ferns that grew a trunk elevating the plants above ground level. One of the most ancient tree-like plants from around 370 million years ago is called Archaeopteris, which had fern-like leaves and reproduced with spores. The plant could reach a reasonable size, a 1.5 meters or 5 foot diameter trunk and a height of 80 feet and was likely one of various species that formed the canopy, the continuous upper layer of foliage in early forests. But... At this point in time, the vegetation on Earth and in its forests looked very different from what we know. Many features of plants or types of plants were nowhere to be found. They just hadn't evolved yet. This was a world without seeds, without flowers, and even without grasses. The first plants with seeds are believed to have appeared around 320 million years ago. A seed is a plant's embryo, a fertilized egg, encased in an outer covering for protection. The seed, which already began to grow within the mother plant, can be detached from it to grow a new plant somewhere else. Without the relative simplicity and resilience of spores, seeds cannot survive as long. Some spores can last for thousands of years before germination, but seeds are a product of sexual reproduction and the advantages that come with it. Their outer layer provides a degree of protection, enclosing all that's needed to begin a new life cycle. As a result of their reproductive advantages, seed plants have successfully expanded to many different habitats, from forests to grasslands. As a result of the development of sexual reproduction among plants, another wonder appeared several tens of millions of years later. Flowers, as well as fruit. The fruit of a plant is not the seed itself. Rather, it is the seed-bearing structure in a flowering plant. As far as we know, the first flower appeared around 140 million years ago. Flowers, in addition to being a thoughtful gift for a loved one, are also a powerful evolutionary innovation because their presence allowed plants to access new reproductive mechanisms in a symbiotic collaboration with insects. When we think about flowers, 
What generally comes to mind is their beauty, their colors, their wonderful scents, and these attractive features are not accidental. Many flowers have evolved to be attractive to animals so as to use them for the transportation of pollen. Flowers are actually modified leaves. At the center of a flower, there is an ovary and also female reproductive cells, eggs, as well as pollen that contains male reproductive cells. Now a plant may self-pollinate when its own male and female reproductive cells combine. But the main advantage and purpose of flowers is so that animals will transport pollen from one flower to the next, hopefully between plants of the same species, and in doing so, contribute to the dispersal and diversity of genes. Flowering plants have, as a result, become the most diverse group of land plants, with 300,000 known species. But these were not the only, nor the first branch of seed plants, because there are actually two types, two branches of seed plants, and both include trees we are familiar with. The most common are flowering plants, also called angiosperms, meaning a plant that produces seeds within an enclosure. In other words, a plant that produces fruit. Once the flower has served its purpose by aiding in fertilization of the egg, it withers and a fruit grows around the seed or seeds. But there is a second, more ancient family of seed plants called gymnosperms. Gymnosperms do not produce flowers or fruits. Their seeds instead develop on the surface of scales or leaves. So instead of seeds contained within a fruit, gymnosperms have their eggs exposed on leaves. These leaves, though, are often modified to form cones. The most common gymnosperms are conifers, like pine trees, and we all know what pine cones look like. They are vessels for the seeds of gymnosperms. To be clear, not all flowers are spectacular. For example, birch trees, which are abundant in the northern hemisphere, are flowering trees, even though their seeds look a lot like tiny pine cones. And they usually coexist with pine trees in boreal forests forests in the north of the northern hemisphere. Birches have distinctive trunks with layers of thin papery sheets that are often white or silver, but they can also be gray, yellow, or even black. They are so-called pioneer species because of how sturdy they are. They withstand cold and can grow in relatively poor soils, like many conifers do. There is another characteristic, though, that distinguishes birch from pine trees that may grow nearby. A birch loses its leaves 
is deciduous, whereas pine trees are evergreen. Plants that shed their leaves. It can be trees, shrubs, or even herbs are called deciduous. Why have so many trees developed this particular trait when shedding leaves every year looks like a waste of energy and resources? Deciduous trees, of which there are many, maple, many oaks, aspen, beech, elm, have advantages compared to plants with evergreen foliage. Of course, it takes resources to regrow new foliage, but those resources are at least in part returned to the tree. When leaves fall to the ground, around it in the form of minerals. And getting rid of foliage allows a tree to avoid water loss during winter when the air is drier and prevents evaporation from the leaves. This also helps to avoid predation from herbivores. In colder regions, deciduous trees are spared branch and trunk breakage due to snow and ice, and repairing and maintaining leaves may be more costly in some cases than just losing them and regrowing them later. All in all, deciduous and evergreen trees have their advantages and disadvantages and coexist in nature. What is fascinating about plants is how these various species of trees detect changes in their environment and then trigger the loss or regrowth of leaves. This indicates that trees, like so many other living things, have an internal biological clock or sensors able to measure the temperature, the light, moisture levels, and may use it all. What triggers trees to shed their leaves depends on the species. Some trees, when they detect a lasting fall in temperatures, go into winter mode and stop maintaining their leaves, which then wither and fall. This generally happens in autumn, and the accompanying change in leaves' colors creates a wonderful fall landscape. The length of daylight can also tell trees when to drop their foliage. In tropical forests, trees shed their leaves as a result of a change in rainfall patterns. During the dry period, foliage is dropped to conserve water, and in this case, doesn't depend on seasons. It can happen any time during the year. When the climate stays dry or wet for an extended period of time, trees no longer have their leaves for photosynthesis. They stop growing and go to sleep for a few months, a kind of hibernation. But stored inside their roots, their trunk, and their branches is everything they need to restart a new cycle. All these characteristics developed over tens of millions of years of plant evolution. And by the time of the dinosaurs, in the Cretaceous and the Jurassic periods, forests' ecosystems were similar to how they are today. Yet a major part of plants was still missing. There was no grass. 
many plants that are now abundant, from cereal grasses to bamboo to cultivated lawns, have not yet appeared. These are all part of the family of grasses, also called graminae. This family of flowering plants on which a large part of our agriculture is based, appeared as the dinosaurs were nearing extinction around 66 million years ago. But it would have been earlier, as dating of their origins is still imprecise. But in any case, they appeared long after the first trees. Some forms, like bamboo, would join forests or create their own. Grasses, in general, proved to be very good at colonizing open spaces, creating grassland, savanna, prairie, or wetlands. All sorts of plants are important to humans, whether indirectly through their impact on the climate and the atmosphere, and the preservation of soils, or directly as a source of food or building materials. But probably no family of plants is as important as grasses, because they are the basis of agriculture. Corn, rice, wheat, and so on, they are all grass. They form the basis for herding and even provide building materials like bamboo and straw. Humanity as we know it could not exist without grasses. In the 60 million years that separate humans from the emergence of grasses, all families of plants have continued to evolve and adapt to their environment, but as far as we know, the type of habitats that we call forests were formed and functioned 60 million years ago as they continue to function today. From the most basic algae in the soils and lichen to mosses, ferns, seed plants, and grasses. The biggest factor that has affected forests in the intervening years is mankind. As I mentioned before, there are about 400 trees per human being in the world. This might seem like a lot, but this number has continued to decrease. Before the advent of agriculture around 10,000 years BC. It is estimated that Earth had twice as many trees as it does now. But human populations have exploded. For example, in 1800, when the Industrial Revolution began, the Earth had a population of one billion. Today, the population stands at 8.5 billion. While human activity has continued to reduce forested areas, this trend varies depending on location. In North America, Europe, and Russia, overall forested areas are stable or slightly growing, but this can't compensate. For deforestation in the tropics and in the southern atmosphere, in Brazil, Africa, and Southeast Asia, still forest covers almost one-third of the land on Earth, and for the most part, their biomass is trees, the largest plant form. 
So let's take a look at how a tree works behind the bark, because a tree is an amazing organism. It pumps water from the soil and sends it sometimes tens of meters upward. It has no muscles. A tree creates the material it is made of from literal air. A large portion of a tree is made up of wood, and wood is made up of lignin and cellulose. Both are complex materials, but both are composed of three main ingredients, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, just organized differently. This different composition means that lignin repels water, is hydrophobic, while cellulose tends to absorb it. Lignin is also what gives wood its rigidity, which is essential. The two ingredients combine to form the plant tissue that we call wood. Trees, as we already discussed, can divide their cells and expand in size as they accumulate building materials they take from their environment. This expansion is responsible for the growth rings, also called tree rings, in wood. When trees grow continuously in regions with little seasonal difference, the rings will be almost invisible or even absent. But when seasons are most distinct, the annual growth period will result in the addition of a visible ring, a new layer of young wood between the existing wood and bark. The young wood is called sapwood, and it is the part of the trunk that conducts water from the roots to the leaves, and also that stores up and gives back the energy reserves produce in the leaves. The oldest part of a tree at the center of the trunk is called the heartwood and is usually dead and sometimes even rots away, leaving the center of the tree hollow. The outermost roughest layers of bark on older trees are also dead. On young trees, the bark may be smooth, but as the tree ages, the bark will become rougher due to its exposure to the outside world and due to tension from the inside as new layers grow, making all these wrinkles appear at the surface of the tree. So how does the vascular system inside a tree work? A tree needs to pump in two directions. Water and nutrients travel up from the soil to the foliage the byproducts of photosynthesis, the sugars, have to descend to the trunk and roots to be used and stored up for future use. The first kind of tissue responsible for carrying water upwards is called xylem, which carries sap, but a sap mainly consists of water and inorganic elements coming from the soil. But how can a tree with no muscles or mechanical parts transport water several meters or dozens of meters above ground? It has to be a passive transport, and this is actually what is believed to limit the maximum height of trees. There are several phenomena and several theories 
that explain how the water rises in the tree. The first one is a pull mechanism from the top of the tree due to the evaporation of water in the leaves. In other words, as water evaporates from the leaves, this creates a suction mechanism that pulls up more water. The vessels transporting the water are very small in diameter, meaning that water can easily rise due to the capillarity when evaporation creates negative pressure at the top. Another mechanism is root pressure. The roots are in the soil, but they tend to have a lower water potential than the soil. So what does this mean? Well, water has a tendency to move from one area to another due to osmosis. When it comes into close contact with a solution that has a higher concentration of elements dissolved in it, osmosis will rebalance the concentration between the two solutions. In this case, that means the osmotic differential between the roots and the soil they are in sends water upwards, away from the roots, to rebalance their osmotic pressure with that of the soil. And yet another mechanism that makes water go up in the tree is a different osmotic phenomenon. The sap in the xylem has a low concentration of elements and is primarily water. Higher up in the tree is a much richer sap, a solution that contains more of the sugars produced in the leaves. This imbalance also tends to draw water upward. These are the mechanisms that allow water to circulate in a tree that otherwise has no active pumping mechanism. One more note about xylem sap. It is the primary ingredient of maple syrup. There are several kinds of maples that produce this sweet xylem sap, and 40 gallons of xylem sap, when reduced by cooking, produce one gallon of maple syrup. The fibers that carry photosynthesis byproducts to parts of the plant where they are needed, generally downwards, are called phloem fibers and are present in roots, stems, and leaves. Phloem transports the rich sap full of the sugars produced in the leaves to the rest of the tree. So there is a xylem sap, the one that moves up, and the phloem sap, which is richer in sugars. Thanks to the phloem sap, trees are able to stock up on resources in their trunks and roots. Apart from serving to anchor the tree to the ground and gather nutrients. Roots serve many additional purposes, energy storage, reproduction, defense, sometimes even revival. You may have seen a new tree popping out of apparently nowhere near another one in the same species or reviving from the base or stump of a dead trunk. This is still the same tree, and it is able to grow unused sapling because its roots were preserved. Roots are also a world in themselves. So let's take a look at them. 
when a new plant appears from a seed, for example, it has an embryonic root, the radical that goes straight downwards and develops into a tap root. After a while, lateral roots branch out and grow horizontally. Near the tips of the finer roots are little hairs made of a single cell that are in contact with the soil and can absorb water and nutrients by osmosis. But how does a germinated seed know which way is up and which way is down? Because saplings systematically make their roots search for soil and their stem grows straight. But how do they do that? Plants don't have eyes or any sensory organs to perceive their environment. It is actually still a bit of a mystery. For a long time, it was believed that light guided the growth of trees and explained why they grew straight. Another possible explanation was that they could perceive gravity or the magnetic field of the earth, which somehow guided their growth. Maybe there is something to all of this, but recent experiments suggest that something more complex is at work. For the experiment, very young saplings were placed in a centrifuge that constantly spun and distorted any sense of up and down. The saplings were also deprived of any light that could act as a guide, and still they grew straight with the roots going one way and the straight stem the other. So at this point, we don't fully understand how it works. Tree roots form complex systems underground and don't work alone. As roots develop underground, they encounter filaments of fungi and form mutualistic relationships with them. Trees acquire minerals like phosphorus from the fungi and the fungi get food. A bit of the sugar is produced by photosynthesis. The fungi sometimes grow filaments that connect the roots of various trees, forming a network through which signals and nutrients may be transferred. This association between roots began a long time ago when the first vascular plants colonized dry land. But there's more. Sometimes the roots of different trees directly connect, their tissues merging and the trees form a connection, a colony, that is invisible from the surface. Experiments in recent decades have revealed that these tree colonies interact and communicate, and that the communities they form are much more complex than previously understood. For example, Traceable chemicals were injected into one tree and shortly thereafter found in neighboring trees that shared the same root system. Some trees have a defense mechanism that will close their leaves in response to the detection of a threat and produce volatile compounds that can kill microbes and prevent rotting or being eaten by insects and animals. When one tree is exposed to such a threat and reacts, all the trees nearby may also react the same way. 
as if the first tree had warned them. We don't know exactly how this works. If it is through the release of compounds in the tree levels, or underground through the connected roots, but the behavior strongly suggests that there is a form of communication and exchange of information that happens between trees. We may not define trees as sentient or thinking organisms, but they are definitely more elaborate complex and awe-inspiring than previous generations understood them to be. And some trees can reach sizes, masses, or ages that defy our imagination. The tallest standing tree in the world at the moment is a sequoia also known as coastal redwood, named Hyperion, and located in Redwood National Park in California. The tree was measured at 380 feet, 116 meters, the height of a 30 to 35 story building, and is estimated to be six to eight hundred years old. Its exact location in the park is kept secret to protect it from damage. Coastal redwoods often reach impressive heights, and trees over 200 feet are quite common. They can reach such impressive heights in part because they have a very long lifespan and can typically live 16 to 18 centuries. There are some coastal redwoods that were already standing at the time of the Roman Empire and ever since, having accomplished hundreds and hundreds of growth cycles gaining a bit of height and a bit of width every year. Another factor that helps them is the climate. They are native to the coastal regions of California and Oregon, and these coasts are foggy. I told you earlier that an important mechanism that limits the height of trees is the difficulty to lift water from the ground up hundreds of feet. But fog limits evaporation at the top, so the need to bring water to the leaves is less. Coastal redwoods are typically among the trees that form communities. Trees connect their root systems and the sharing of roots keeps alive mutant trees that might not have survived on their own. These are called albino redwoods, and more than 200 of them are known to exist. These trees have a mutation that prevents them from manufacturing chlorophyll. So instead of being green, their foliage is snow white and unable to photosynthesize. They survive as parasites, fed by their green neighbors, allowing them to reach adulthood and even heights up to 66 feet or 12 meters. But maybe they are more than parasites. Research indicates that these albino trees can store higher concentrations of toxic metals. So maybe they serve as waste dumps for their neighboring trees. Redwoods are confers. They're evergreens, gymnosperms, so their seeds are in cones. Interestingly, redwoods benefit from fire. 
Their combs, as large as the trees are, are tiny and are designed to be opened by fire. The term for this is serotness. Fire also opens room in the canopy for light to penetrate and clears the forest floors of debris, exposing the soil and minerals therein. The tallest angiosperm flowering plant is also the second largest tree in the world. It is a yellow maranti on the island of Borneo and was measured at 331 feet. To reach such a height, these trees must have an impressive girth, but there are trees with even bigger diameters. The record for the widest living tree goes to a cypress in the south of Mexico, the Arbol del Tule. Its height is not that impressive at only around 35 meters, but it has a circumference of almost 140 feet. It is so large that it was initially believed to be multiple trees whose trunks had fused. But DNA analysis has shown that this, in fact, is only one tree. Maybe this single tree developed several trunks that ended up merging, but it is undeniably old, with estimates of its age around 1,500 years based on growth rates. The tree was already at least a thousand years old when the Spanish arrived in Mexico. And there is an old Zapotec legend that attributes the planting of the tree to a priest of the Aztec god of wind. The second tree with the widest trunk is a baobab tree in South Africa. The Sunland baobab. Baobabs can be very big trees too. There are some in Arabia and Australia, but the majority are in Africa, including on the island of Madagascar. They are also angiosperms, with flowers and fruit that hang from the tree when it blooms. Baobabs can live thousands of years, and some specimens have been found to be more than 2,000 years old. There are different species of baobabs, but many of these trees live in arid regions so they have become experts at water preservation. They are deciduous and shed their leaves during the dry season to limit evaporation and also store water in their trunks. Just one of these trees can store up to 120,000 liters for a large specimen. That's 32,000 U.S. gallons. With these reserves, they can survive even with the most serious droughts, though several species are currently threatened by human activity and changes in climate. And there are even older trees than the baobabs. The oldest known single tree alive is also in California, in the mountains of Eastern California. It has been dated to almost 5,000 years, meaning that it is older than the pyramids of Egypt. It is a bristlecone pine tree, named Methuselah, logically, since Methuselah was a biblical patriarch said to have died 
at the age of 969. Only one other living tree is known to be more than 3,000 years old. A Patagonian cypress from Chile called El Gran Abuelo, the Great Grandfather. But these records of age are for individual trees, as we have seen before. New trees can regrow from roots, and when a colony has appeared with several trees sharing their root system, this colony, taken as a single organism, becomes theoretically eternal or at least it can outlive any single tree. There is a root system in Sweden, old Chico, which is almost 10,000 years old. It's a clonal tree. The roots themselves started to develop 10 million years ago, but it regrows a trunk every few centuries. Even bigger and older is Pando in Utah, in the United States. Pando is another clonal colony born from a single aspen, which has been determined to be a single organism by genetic testing. It has one massive root system that covers more than a hundred acres. And from this root system, new systems constantly grow. There are currently 47,000 stems. So it is basically a single organism that looks like a small forest. On average, the stems and trunks are only 130 years old each. But the colony is way older and has been dated to at least 80,000 years. Some even estimate its age to be a million years. On a sad note, in August of 2023, wildfires swept through Maui in the state of Hawaii and destroyed the town of Lahaina. In addition to concerned for their loved ones, of course, residents also feared for the survival of a local tree known as the Lahaina Banyan tree, which was also scorched by the fire. The tree, a gift from missionaries in 1873, had recently celebrated its 150th birthday and in its century and a half of life, had grown 60 feet and covered over two-thirds of an acre with its expansive canopy. The tree had also become a local meeting point, gathering spot and landmark, the site of multiple events, protests, markets, and an annual Christmas banyan tree lighting. But what appeared to be the end of this beautiful tree, it turned a corner when for several days contractors and construction companies delivered 5,000 to 10,000 gallons of water a day, and experts announced that the tree was showing bright green leaves and describing this as a positive sign for its long-term recovery. Expert arborists are volunteering their time to nurse the banyan tree back to health. There would be many more things to say about nature and plants and trees, but this is all for tonight. We have reached the end of our exploration journey. I hope you enjoyed it, and it piques your interest to learn more about trees. Now, 
it's time to let go. And until we meet again, good night, sleep well.